In this final video we will go over the global results um, that underpin the main result from uh, our paper uh, From Global to Local, an Index Bound for Umbilic Points on Smooth Convex Surfaces by myself and Wilhelm Klingenberg, um, which was recently posted on the archive. Okay, so the setting of these global results is what is known as classically as the Riemann-Hilbert problem. So the Riemann-Hilbert problem is as follows. What you have is a 4-manifold M and a complex structure J, and you have a totally real surface contained in M. So this has no complex points. And you ask, it's a boundary value problem, and you seek a function f, say from the disk into your 4-manifold, with two properties. The first property is that uh, it is holomorphic, and the second property is that f of the boundary of the disk is to lie in this given totally real surface. So if you take your totally real surface like that, you're looking for a disk which is holomorphic and has boundary lying in this totally real surface. Um, now this is, classically it's well known, this is an elliptic boundary value problem. Um, and what that means, or one consequence of that, is that uh, at a solution, so if you have a solu one solution, you have the uh, analytic index, which is the dimension of the kernel of the linearization of the Delbar operator minus the dimension of the co-kernel of the linearization of the Delbar operator. Now, another way of writing that, in fact, is it's the Maslov class uh, plus two. Here's your Maslow, Maslow index of the boundary. Um, now, what, how you use this in general would be to try and find this nearby holomorphic. If you have one solution, then you want to find what's the space of solutions. And in that case, what you have here is the kernel of the Delbar operator. This dimension would, should give you the dimension of the space of disks. The, pr the problem is that um, your co-kernel interferes with that. If you know the analytic index, your co-kernel can uh, uh, cancel out some of the, the this. So, the idea then would be to try and kill the co-kernel or find situations in which this is zero and then the analytic index tells you how many holomorphic disks or the, the dimension of the space of holomorphic disks uh, near a given one. Um, so a typical kind of result, uh, one that's uh, useful to compare with our own, is the follow, following one of O from 1996, that if M is not only a complex uh, surface, but it has a Kähler structure. And being Kähler, I mean here that this is definite. So this is the standard setting. There's no neutral Kähler or any that kind of stuff. It's just a definite uh, metric. And moreover, let's assume that sigma is Lagrangian with respect to the symplectic structure. Now, in this setting, the result is then uh, there exists open dense set of deformations Uh, the Grangian deformations, in fact, of sigma, such that f is what's referred to as Fred Holm regular. Fred Holm regular, and by that we just mean co-kernel zero. So co-kernel of the linearization is zero. So then the analytic index really does give you uh, the dimension of the space of holomorphic disks. Notice here your space of holomorphic disks uh, you can act on by the Möbius group. So in fact, if you have uh, you know if you have one disk, in fact you have three you know three parameter family from the Möbius group. Okay, so with that then that's the kind of classical setting in which our global result uh, sits. And essentially, in our proof of the Carathéodory conjecture, um, we prove the following. So instead of just any manifold, let's take TS2, J, omega, and G. And here we have this neutral metric. Neutral metric. So we have our neutral Kähler structure. Um, now, this poses problems in the following sense. In, in O's result, uh, the fact that your surface was Lagrangian ensured that it had no complex points, and so therefore it was elliptic and uh, you had no difficulty. Our difficulty is that we have closed uh, Lagrangian surfaces always have complex points in our setting, because of this neutral metric, uh, such behavior is allowed. However, 
if you kind of concentrate all that badness into one point, so if you take your real surface that you want to use as a boundary condition, let's assume that it's Lagrangian, um, um, compact and embedded. In fact, it's true of, of O's result, perhaps I should have said that in any event. And moreover, the key thing here is, it has to have a single complex point. So all the badness is concentrated in one point on this surface. And then the fact is that you have a huge isometry group on TS2. We've already mentioned this. This is the Euclidean group, um, you know, rotations and translations acting on the space of oriented lines in, in, in our interpretation of it. In any event, it has a transitive isometry group, and you can fix a point um, on your boundary condition, and it turns out that the arguments then go through. So the result then is the same. Then there exists an open, dense set of deformations, Lagrangian deformations, of sigma, such that the co-kernel at a solution, the co-kernel of the um, linearization of the del bar operator is zero. Okay, so that's one side of uh, uh, of the coin. The other side is is the following, and again, it's it's this is all goes into the proof of the global Carathéodory conjecture. If you have if you have a surface uh, containing uh, a totally real, again here we're all in TS2, totally real Lagrangian hemisphere. This is a Lagrangian hemisphere with no complex points. Um, then the co-kernel of the linearization as a solution to this problem is never zero. Okay, so this is kind of runs in the, exactly the opposite direction, so let me just say a little bit about the, the proof. And uh, it's, 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 it's rather involved, and it involves mean curvature flow. But by mean curvature flow, we show that um, given any totally real Lagrangian hemisphere, uh, there exists um, F going from D into TS2, which is holomorphic and whose boundary of the boundary of the disk lies on this totally real Lagrangian hemisphere. So this is saying that a totally real Lagrangian hemisphere is a good boundary condition for um, for the del bar. Now we use the solution of a second order equation, we reduce it to a first order, um, but in any event we show that there are plenty of these um, um, holomorphic disks uh, and they can be always be attached to um, these totally real Lagrangian hemisphere. And if you perturb a totally real Lagrangian hemisphere it will in fact stay totally real in Lagrangian. Uh, these are open conditions. And so, in fact, um, we would have uh, exactly this, um, uh, uh, this for any nearby variation as well. Moreover, um, if you take, so if you have some surface sigma and you have a disk whose boundary lies in it, um, because this surface may have complex points, in our case it doesn't, but uh, in this particular theorem, but as well as it had some complex points at gamma j, well then the Maslow class of the boundary of the disk we prove is in fact the sum of the complex points, sum of the in the complex twice the sum of the index of the complex points, complex points inside the curve. So the Maslow class counts the number of uh, complex points inside the curve in this setting. Um, now, if, we're, if what we're looking at is this totally real Lagrangian hemisphere, of course there are no uh, complex points inside, so this is in fact zero. So as a consequence, uh, what we find is your analytic index is, which is the dimension of the kernel uh, of the linearization minus the dimension of the co-kernel of the linearization of the del bar operator, uh, is two. Now, as I already said, this already has three. If it has one, it's three, because you see you, you, the Mobius group. So if you want to get rid of this um, parameterization by the uh, uh, by quotient down by the Mobius group, uh, in fact, this drops to minus one. And so that tells you that your co-kernel cannot be zero. So your co-kernel, so the dimension of the co-kernel of the linearization is not zero.
Okay, so now we're in a situation where we can compare these two. This tells you that if you have a compact embedded Lagrangian surface with a single complex point, well then, a nearby one, certainly the, the co-kernel will be zero. On the other hand, if it contains a totally real Lagrangian hemisphere, the co-kernel will never be zero. And it is precisely this, then, that leads us to um, the following, which is, um, so the upshot um, of the corollary. Yeah. So no surface uh, sigma in TS2 can have the following properties. Properties. So the, the properties are um, the first one, well, compact and embedded. The second property is that it ha uh, contain, contains a totally real Lagrangian hemisphere. And the third property is that it contains a single complex point. Okay, so the first and the second would tell you that the co-kernel is zero for a deformation of it, whereas the third one tells you the co-kernel is never zero for any deformation of such a surface. Um, now, this in brief then tells you that no such surface can exist. You can't have a surface like that. And now, back backpedaling to our main theorem, if you recall, what we had started out with uh, when expressed in TS2 is we started out with the surface um, with an isolated index, uh, um, umbilic, or complex point, I guess, in TS2 of index 4 plus k. We attached it to a holomorphic, sorry, to a totally real Lagrangian hemisphere. And then we had these complex points in here, which we got rid of by uh, uh, gluing in these cross caps. Um, our totally real blow up, as we referred it to. So, yeah. Yes. So, but this is totally real, and this is totally real, and we have a single constant. And again, we can see that such an object can't exist. Okay, so we can't. Now, if you had a different index here, of course, um, you would have plus ones knocked around here, which you couldn't get rid of by any kind of gluing. So you can see this, this, the role of this semi-local uh, construction, uh, removing uh, it only removes hyperbolic complex points, and this is precisely what gives the sidedness to our result. Okay, so before uh, finishing, let me just again mention um, a dichotomy that appears at this point. So, uh, our result implies the existence of exotic umbilic points. So, essentially, if you have a smooth surface uh, in R3, um, what we've just shown is that this isolated comp uh, in, uh, umbilic points must have index less than 2. Now, a well-known result from the 40s by Hans Hamburger uh, in the real analytic case, in fact, proves that the index must be less than or equal to one. But of course, your um, umbilic index is a half integer. So what we find then is that the possibility is there and uh, certainly is indicated. It, it's it's a question of sharpness, I guess, of our results. That one cannot improve on this in the smooth category. I think the topological argument and the nature of the argument suggests that this is simply not possible to uh, improve on this bound. It is a sharp bound, and then of necessity we find that you must have um, smooth, non-real analytic surfaces in R3 containing uh, isolated umbilic points of index 3 over 2, which we refer to as exotic umbilics.